we won't attract people to desktop Linux by emulating what Mac OS and Windows do because we are always second fiddle to what they're doing. The only way we will attract um, new, oh dear me, I can't believe I'm saying new users. The only way we will attract more people to desktop Linux is to do something distinctive, something different, something compelling that means coming to the Linux desktop is a better experience in some you know, objective way. We talked, uh, you know, about Compiz earlier. It might have been a bit of frippery, but it was absolutely distinctive and different. And you could only get it on Linux. And that was one of the reasons why people came to Linux back then in order to get that. We don't want frippery. We want more meaningful features, but we need distinctive features that will bring people to desktop Linux because it's just better. It can't be like a facsimile of what other organizations are already doing. And that's why they pay you the big bucks. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But <laughs> seriously, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't have said it better. Welcome back. It's uh, thank you for joining us and listening in on today's episode of, of IG Talks. I haven't come up with a better name, so that's what we're rolling with at this point. Uh, and today we've got the one and only Martin Wimpress on the other end of the line, and we'll be having a conversation about so many things, but uh, Ubuntu desktop and snap packages and, uh, and his new role as it's evolving at Canonical now. Um, but honestly, he doesn't need too much of an introduction because uh, this guy is all over the internet, especially in and around Linux, free software, and, uh, and the Ubuntu sphere. Um, so a big welcome to you, uh, Martin, and thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, I have been looking forward to our conversation for some time. It's great to have you. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's been, it's terrific to sort of meet you at long last. You know, I've been following your videos for a long, long time, even, you know, before I was involved in, in Ubuntu, uh, you know, professionally. Um, so yeah, it's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this chat and uh, what we might unearth and unpick. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, for those of you who don't know, um, so Martin is quite an experienced podcaster. He's, uh, I mean, you were involved in the Ubuntu podcast. You're involved in uh, Linux Unplugged occasionally. Uh, yeah. What other ones? Yeah. Uh, well, those, those are the main ones. Okay. So, you know, m more recently, the Ubuntu podcast, I've been involved there for about four years, I think now. Uh, and, and for a similar amount of time, I've been an occasional talking head on Linux Unplugged. And actually, I think Linux Unplugged was really where I sort of cut my teeth with podcasting, even before I got involved in, in the Ubuntu podcast. Um, so that was, you know, that was really because, you know, things were changing and going to Linux user groups was no longer a, a thing that was happening sort of around here where I, I live in, in England. Uh, and there was a new online community forming around, you know, podcasts. So, you know, I moved my focus of attention there to uh, reconnect with with my tribe, if you like. Very good, very good. Well, uh, well, look, let's let's start out the conversation with uh, with your introduction to sort of free and open source software. I've I've kind of shared my story uh, uh, briefly on on these episodes before with um, different guests that we've had in the past. Um, basically, my introduction was around uh looking for free and uh as in financially free uh software mm -hmm. to do to do media projects on um because i was just i uh, didn't have any money and uh and that introduced me to the world of, of linux and alternative operating systems and i just dove down a rabbit hole and i'm, I'm still falling right. um so so what what was your introduction to like free and open source software and to and to gnu linux and and that whole sphere so I think those two introductions were rather separate from one another. I think my introduction to free and open source software predated my involvement in Linux. And that was when I was at university, uh, I was studying software engineering and one of our lecturers was teaching the C and C++ course. And in the throes of that, the option was to buy a copy of Borland C++ or he had a bunch of floppy disks that he would copy the uh, then embryonic GCC compiler onto and you could use the GCC compiler. So 
I think that was my very first introduction to sort of FOSS. Although, looking back, I don't think I had any appreciation for what that was or what it meant back then. Um, you know, I realized I was getting a compiler for free, um, but I, you know, I really didn't, I really didn't have any appreciation for the the wider movement that was emerging at that time so that would have been the very early 1990s i think when when i got those those uh floppy disks and for linux itself um not long after so after graduating from university uh, i was working for an organization and they were running uh xenix which was uh, a unix like operating system uh, from microsoft in fact and also SCO Unix and System 5 release for um, Unix operating systems. And I was quite taken with the fact that they were proper multitasking operating systems. And at the time, doing that on DOS was, well, impossible. Doing that on Windows was kind of faux. You know, it wasn't really multitasking. And I kind of got close with um, Quarter Deck Desk View. But I was really seeking, you know, this this multitasking world. And I'd kind of sort of gravitated to OS2. And then through colleagues at work, learned there was this thing called Linux. And while we were using all of these commercial Unix operating systems at work, there was no way I could afford them. So a bit like, um, you know, you were saying, it was really sort of a, an economic driver that well hey this linux thing doesn't actually cost me anything other than the cost of a couple of boxes of floppy disks and somewhere to go and get them from so that was when i got started with with linux was to sort of recreate that unix like operating system that i was well, i was using professionally at the time yeah and i mean for me when my introduction to linux came along which was a good deal after that um it just uh, you know it blows my mind how much more uh development and polish was already in the linux desktop um for me it was in the it would have been in the mid 2000s um mid to late 2000s right. and um at that point you know the linux on the desktop had matured considerably uh, and uh, obviously, you know, it still had a ways to go. And I look at where it is now compared to where it was back then, and it's come ahead in leaps and bounds. So I can't imagine what it would be like for someone like yourself seeing it, you know, mature from the days of, um, yeah, from the days of a very sort of raw alternative. At least um, my knowledge of, of Linux history is not detailed, but I, from what I can remember, um, Linux and and a desktop Linux kernel was what hadn't been around for very long by the early 90s like it surely only arose in yeah. those recent like in those early 90s kind of years late 80s early yes yeah, so, yeah so well Linux sort of got born in sort of 91 yeah. and I think the first time I installed a Linux operating system was 94 oh. and even then that was that was very early on well not very early on but it was it was quite early on and it was like you say it was raw and uh, but then again uh, back then so was Unix operating systems for PC I think you know the most polished at the time were either Solaris x86 which had a very sort of constrained you know supported hardware set i i worked for sun you know in and around that era so that was that was a product that i supported in fact so you know i was familiar with you know what did and didn't work there and then there was sco um and that looked very pretty but you know it was basically just a you know a window manager and and li little else you know all of the the x utilities so yeah it was very early days and i can remember my first introductions because at that time next step was sort of making lots of waves of course you know at, you know uh, at the time and there was a lot of effort to um simulate stroke emulate you know that look and feel so i can remember my early years of linux were pursuing you know something that looked like you know a next desktop you know um and you know that was an exercise in futility, but it was it was fun and it taught me an awful lot about you know the Linux at that time what the Linux ecosystem was, what the what the tools were, and what you could do with it. Guilty as charged, I um, 
before I found uh, Linux and open source alternatives, my I, <laughs> I, I chose the worst possible option to try and uh, get other operating systems running on my Dell tower at the time. And uh, I went down the route of, uh, of Hackintosh and the Darwin x86 project. And uh, uh, it, um, yeah, I, it kind of worked, but never for very long. And uh, it was an exercise in futility, if, uh, if you want to put it that way. So, uh, but it, it, again, it did teach me a lot about operating systems right. and how they work. And then that became very useful experience going into the Linux side of things. Um, even though I wish in hindsight that I'd done it the other way around, um, because even Linux at that point was a dream boat compared to the, ni <laughs> the nightmare of trying to run OS X. Uh, on on non Mac hardware. Um, anyway, wow. So there's there's oh there's so much heritage packed into packed into that uh, story already. Fast forwarding to more recent times, and um, I believe I'm probably picking a date here of around 2014 2015. Um, Ubuntu uh, Ubuntu Mate. When did that project uh, sort of evolve and what was the what was the story behind that i understand at least from a bit of reading that uh that yourself and alan pope were sort of some of the original drivers behind that project and clearly you know you're still very actively involved in that project um but uh my i'm curious as to where did that project come from what was the impetus behind that so so it actually started a couple of years prior to that mm -hmm. um at that time, I was, um, by the way, internet law requires that I tell you this. I used to be an Arch Linux developer, by the way. Um, so in 2012, I was uh, uh, very heavily involved in the Arch Linux community. And at that time, I was quite happily using, uh, albeit an embryonic GNOME 3. Uh, and uh, I'd moved my wife over to that as well. Uh, and it was around that time that, you know, we had um, uh, our first, uh, well, our daughter. And um, and so she wasn't using a computer very much. Um, and when she did, a couple of years later, start using her computer in anger, she was like, what has changed? You know, what happened in the last two years? This isn't what I remember. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is the new thing. It's like, <laughs> I hate it. Make it go away and make the other thing come back. And at that time, I knew that Mate was a thing, but I'd never actually used it. And I was like, well, Mate is that continuation of GNOME 2. So I uninstalled GNOME 3 from her machine, installed uh, Mate, and uh, Wedded Bliss was restored, and she had a comfortable you know, computing environment back. And everything on the surface sort of seemed fine. But I was aware there were some things that were broken and not quite right. And I was thinking, well, if I'm going to have my wife run this thing, I should probably fix this stuff because then it will just be smooth sailing. So I got involved in Mate at that point. So initially just packaging for Arch and then like patches and fixes upstream. And this is how most people's involvement in open source projects start. You know, you've got your own itch to scratch and you just sort of fall in quite accidentally into a world so yeah that's how i got introduced to the mate project uh really continuity for my wife and also for my my sort of immediate family who i'd moved to uh well ubuntu some years before so around the 606 release i'd moved lots of my uh immediate family over to ubuntu and they were quite fine with that and then by um you know, by this time, by sort of, you know, 2012, um, 10.04 was getting a bit long in the tooth and we needed somewhere to upgrade grade them to. And they weren't they weren't really happy with Unity or Gnome 3. They weren't a technical crowd. They didn't want to relearn how to use their computers. They just wanted everything to be the same. So I got involved in Mate and then... Through that, I'd started podcasting on Linux Unplugged, I think. I think I decided that, you know, Mate Desktop had a couple of gaps in the sort of, you know, the roles that you could fulfill there. And one was kind of like um, community manager type role. So I was like, right, this year, you know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to represent the project. I spoke to all the guys upstream and they were like, yeah, fine, you know, you, you do that. So I went on a few podcasts talking about Mate and that's where it started. 
And one of those interviews was on the Ubuntu podcast. Um, you know, it, I don't know, 2012, 2013, something like that. Um, and during that interview, I pointed out that actually Mate in, in Ubuntu was horribly broken and it was a big fat mess and, you know, it needed, needed lots of work. Uh, and I think Alan was a little bit unhappy uh, about about that statement. And so a couple of weeks after we'd recorded that interview, uh, I just get an email from, from Alan. Uh, and if you know Alan, this expression will be familiar. The subject of the email was just, ha! And, uh, and inside, inside the, the body of the email was a link to uh, matey.iso. So in actual fact, Alan Pope made the very first version of Ubuntu Mate. Uh, wow. And at that time, it was just called Matey. Um, and I looked at this and the difficulty I was having at the time is that although I'd got my family on Arch Linux running Mate, Arch Linux is kind of a difficult thing to manage from afar for people that are not, you know, technically astute. So my Easter, summer, Christmas breaks with those family members was basically me <clears throat> fixing their computers. And I was like, this, this isn't good. And they weren't happy with it either. Some of them had even stopped using their laptops and were taught there was even talk of them buying, you know, Macs and things. And I was like, you know, this, this whole thing's, you know, the, the wheels are coming off. So um, when Alan sent me this thing, I was like, yeah, basing this around Ubuntu, which is, you know, solid and reliable, this, this looks like a sensible way forward. So um, before you know it, Alan and I have both booked a day off work um, and I went over to, Al Alan's like 20 miles from here, you know, we're, we're, we're two, two towns across from one another. So I went over there and we sat in his kitchen all day, one, one summer, and uh, we put the very first version of Ubuntu Mate together. And Alan kind of looked at me squarely in the eye and said, uh, you're responsible for this now. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's and, uh, and that's kind of where it started. <laughs> oh, wow. That's fantastic. So oh, there's, um, oh, there's, there's so many great moments in that story already. Uh, I can definitely relate to the uh, putting Ubuntu on, you know, friends and family's uh, devices only for them to then have to weather the change of uh, GNOME 3 slash Unity and, and then wanting something familiar. And I mean, to, to be frank, the, I guess the beauty of Linux on the desktop is that unlike uh, other proprietary systems, you, you're not necessarily hamstrung into that right you know those changes if if you don't want it and uh and the fact that ubuntu mate not only exists now but i i would say has quite a decent i uh, you'd probably be able to speak into the metrics more than i can but has quite a decent sort of presence online and i would assume therefore a, a decent user base now um is testament yes. to the fact that people you know enjoy um being able to have that flexibility and not necessarily have to bump up to to whatever the the latest uh you know, paradigm changes or, or desktop changes, as much as I enjoy those two. Um, looking at Ubuntu Mate as a, as a project, um, what would you say, have there been some sort of key highlights or uh, really good moments in the project's lifespan uh, since that, uh, that founding version with, uh, with Alan Pope? <laughs> well, obviously the very first time we were an official flavor, that was obviously a landmark. That was 1504. And actually, at that time, then Entroware approached me and said, hey, we would like to, you know, ship um, Ubuntu Mate on our or have an option to ship Ubuntu Mate on our laptops. So when you think back, that was that was four or five years ago. I think we were among like the first like boutique independent distro that had like an OEM who were prepared to stand behind us. So that was a big deal. Mm. And it also um, closed, closed the gap on my personal support uh, mission because now I'd got an operating system for my family. And more importantly, when my family said, hey, what computer could I buy? Should I buy? I was able to send them a link to Entroware and say, you know, tick the box that says Ubuntu Mate, and they would get a computer that turned up, you know, pre-configured with the operating system I basically designed for them. Excellent. So, you know, this was, this was, <laughs> this was Zen level, you know. Do it Linux for the friends support. and the family. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, uh, and I'm hugely indebted to Entroware for, you know, sticking with us 
all that time because you know uh, ubuntu is is massive by comparison to all of the flavors but there are people that want that familiar sort of you know desktop paradigm as a way to use their computer and entroware have been extremely supportive and without them we wouldn't have had some of the momentum that we have over the years so that was that was super important and then our first lts a year later mm. with 1604 that was a big deal um and then after that that was a gtk2 release so you know between 1604 and 1804 that whole migra migration to gtk3 adding high dpi support you know there was just a huge amount of churn that happened there um, and, and we're still, you know, perfecting that uh, today. I would say, you know, there, we, it, Ubuntu Mate today is, you know, light years ahead. And, uh, you know, somewhere along that timeline, uh, around sixteen ten, I got hired by Canonical, uh, and I was hired on to the desktop team. Um, and so, uh, in that period, I was using and working on Unity Seven exclusively because this is before, you know, the deprioritization of Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really got to appreciate what Unity was striving to achieve, having some years before not bought into what that, you know, mission was. Mm. And ever since then, I've been trying to cherry pick the best of those technologies that came out of what Canonical were doing with Unity 7 and introducing those into Ubuntu Mate, albeit in some cases options that you can turn on. You know, things like the HUD and the global menu. Uh, app indicators are now the default way that we, we do that. You know, we used to have an option, but it, it just made no sense to support uh, old style uh, status icons so we've we've gone all in with with app indicators and there's a lot of cool stuff and when you look at the design thought that went into that you know it's compelling and it, it, and we shouldn't we shouldn't just give it up so you know I'm very happy that we're able to um, continue to make good use of you know that stuff that was developed over many years Mm, definitely and look i can i can mirror a lot of what you're saying in terms of i there was there was an initial a balk at what ubuntu had introduced with the unity desktop especially in its sort of rough early stages i think it was 10.10 mm. i think they first introduced like a netbook kind of uh, remix of it in, in including i quite some liked of the... that netbook that oh, netbook remix i yeah. actually quite liked it was i think it was a little bit after that was like the first actual what we recognize now is unity yes. and i it was just too soon and it wasn't it wasn't ready frankly mm -hmm. and i think that's what put a lot of people off it just clearly wasn't ready but what i will say is by the time uh still to this day my all-time favorite ubuntu release was 14 uh 1404 uh that release for me was um everything or most things in unity 7 had had time to mature and uh, it just felt so uniquely Ubuntu that there, you could find a, an experience in that particular release that you could not really equal in any other in any other Linux distribution. And not that it's about you know competition or, or or that kind of thing, but definitely the ideas that they had for the Unity desktop were so, like you said, unique and compelling that for me, that was when the 1404 release, I was running that on my hardware for I think two years easily uh, without touching it because I was just so happy with uh, a, I'd had time to adjust to, you know, the change, but once I'd kind of figured out the workflow, I guess, or what was working for me, man, I really appreciated it, which then obviously, mm. like you've said, has, has led on to me appreciating a lot of the transference of features between the Unity desktop and some of the things that they are offering, app indicators, uh, the HUD menu, all of those things over to Mate. And, you know, I'm consider me a happy boy because um, that calls back to, you know, a uniquely Ubuntu experience that I had uh, in, uh, in 2014 with their long-term support release that, um, that, yeah, I just, you know, there's, uh, I, I'm constantly learning new ways of doing things and, and I love that about Linux, but there was just something special about that release and being able to see features coming over to, um, to a currently supported desktop environment is, is really exciting. 
Yeah, uh, I think that some of those LTSs really stand out. I think the other one that a lot of people sort of, you know, look back on with fond memories is 1004. Yes. I think, you know, the Lucid Links, that was the last hurrah for GNOME 2. And again, that was also a very polished experience because by the time that release went out, you know, um, what are we looking at? Six years Canonical had been, you know, perfecting that you know desktop experience around gnome 2 and all of that you know slick integration with compis which was you know the 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 hotness on the internet i think uh, responsible for drawing so many people into desktop Absolutely. linux at that time um you know it, that was that was another great release uh, and i think 1204 i think unity was just a little bit too soon in that release but like you say 1404 1604 unity was was really solid by that point and distinctive and different and only just scraping the surface of the full aspirations of you know what canonical wanted to do you can look through the ubuntu wiki at the um at the design plans for you know unity 7 as it was and you can see it's only been sort of you know half half achieved you know uh, in terms of what the grand vision was so mm. yeah I, I would have loved to have seen you know what unity 7 unity 8 or 9 well not 8 because that was a, a divergence in a different direction but what that you know uh, original unity could have become mm, mm. and look you can um, feel free uh, to sort of address this any way you, you see fit but I think uh, at least from the outside looking in, the announcement that Unity was going to be depreciated and and uh, and sort of let go over time. Uh, obviously, for the hardcore Ubuntu fans, that was a, that was a blow. Uh, for others, it was like, a, well, this is a good thing because it means that uh, you know a, a distribution with as much development and as much momentum behind it as Ubuntu could really contribute a lot to upstream projects. Um, or upstream desktop environments not saying that they didn't do that before but you kind of see where I'm going with that and um, so there was a bit of an, a, an opinion divide but from your point of view when uh, the unity desktop was depreciated what would you say would be some of the main sort of uh, reasons behind that in my head it's mostly I'm guessing logistical the fact that it's just expensive and time-consuming to make a, a desktop yeah. environment yeah, I think that there was, um, this was a time where we were trying to find um, commercial viability for all of Canonical. And, you know, there were some projects, and at that time, of course, it wasn't so much Unity 7, but we were going down the road of Unity 8 and mobile and tablet and all the rest of it and convergence. And that was still something of a sort of a skunk works project. And there was a lot of engineering behind that endeavor and we couldn't carry that and seek to achieve everything else that the company was looking to do at that time so those were that was a difficult time for everybody right in fact it was it was a thoroughly miserable time for everybody um i i'd only been in the company for 6 months i was very concerned for my own future at the time uh, everybody was probably concerned for their own future at the time as well uh, we lost a lot of great people uh, back then because it wasn't just uh, wasn't just you know mobile convergence and unity that you know suffered at that uh, you know during that time there was a slimming down you know a, a across all sorts of different different um, parts of the organization um, it's good that UB ports and now, you know, the Ubuntu touch, you know, community were there to pick up, you know, what we were doing with the mobile um, aspirations and they have been terrific custodians of that project. And, you know, take it from strength to strength, albeit, you know, as a niche, you know, um, interest project. But, you know, every time I go to an UbuCon, I'm blown away at the passion and commitment that exists within that community and the, and the advancements that they make every time, you know, that I meet up with them. So that's terrific. And the project lives on, the code lives on, and that's, you know, testament to open source. Um, but at that same time, obviously, we um, made a commitment to switch back to the GNOME desktop. And I think that that has been uh, an excellent unifying moment, you know, for desktop Linux as a whole. Um, 
I still think Unity 7 and, and what Unity 8 could have become on the desktop were terrific endeavors i would have loved to have seen you know unity 8 become you know fulfill its potential but by coming back to gnome all of the major distributions now have gnome as the default desktop environment some of the fragmentation that exists within desktop linux has been sort of healed in that in that process and there is you know a a a larger body of people you know all pull it putting their shoulder behind gnome and all of gnome's stack and making it better for the entire community and that's a good thing i think hey look thanks for checking out part one of this conversation with martin winpress in part two coming in very close succession we're going to be talking about the future of the ubuntu project we talk about snap packages and all of the ramifications that they have on the linux desktop and we wrap up the conversation with some casual chat about microcomputers. So definitely stay tuned for part two coming very, very soon.